We're on a remote site here, 20 miles north of Belfast. Nokdu is a vast headland that towers over the Antrim coast. And on its summit is this, a giant prehistoric earthwork of man-made banks and ditches. But it's never been excavated before, so no one knows what it was for, who built it or when. Finding out is going to be an enormous challenge. For a start, it takes us half an hour by tractor just to get up here. And once on top, you're battered by the fierce winds and rain. Uh, for you. It's late morning on day one, and we're opening our first trench here, a 10 metre long slice right across the ditch and bank system of our prehistoric earthwork. We're looking for evidence of how it was constructed and finds like bits of pottery. Basically anything that might hint at what this earthwork was for and why people went to the trouble of building it here in the first place. Both of which at the moment are a complete mystery. But there could be an important clue down in the valley below. This is where you were looking for some kind of Bronze Age roundhouse, isn't it? How have you got on? We've got it, Tony. I mean, I can't be absolutely certain that it's Bronze Age, but we've certainly got the roundhouse. Look, we've got this tumble of stones. They spreads round in a big arc, coming round here, in this quadrant of the roundhouse. I think this is probably where the wall has actually fallen down the slope. So we've got our roundhouse. And crucially, we've got some finds. Look at that lot. That is all worked flint. Oh, there's a lot of these, isn't there? There must be at least 10 or 20 pieces there, and we've actually got one here that's been retouched into a tool. Look, somebody's chipped off that flint there and retouched that into a little scraper. And all this work flint is coming from the floor of the hut. Great, our first tool. So we think we've got evidence of people living here. We think we know what they did with their dead. But who were they? And when were they around? We need dating evidence. Beginning of day two here at Nokdu in Northern Ireland. As you can see, it's been raining all night and the trenches have filled up with water. The four by fours can't get up here anymore. Look at the state of that trench there. The tractor got stuck in the mud. We've all had to walk up half a mile of this carrying our equipment before we can even start. But it's been all worthwhile, so the archaeologists tell me, because we found this incredible system of prehistoric defensive ditches. Not only that, We've also got a prehistoric roundhouse, complete with evidence of the people who lived in it. Although I keep getting confused, Francis, because I think of this as the whole roundhouse, but in fact, it's only a quarter of it, isn't it? Yes, you can see the walls going on the outside there, round back behind us, right round there, and then that's the doorway. What's the significance of this find for you? Well, what's really exciting about it is this is a proper house. This is a permanent dwelling for people. And we've got the debris they left behind them on the floor in the form of flints. What do we do with it now? Well, we, we've got to define those walls, and then I think we'll extend in this direction to see how it's been set back into the hillside. What else are we going to do? What are your other targets? Well, do you remember yesterday, at the end of the day, we discovered this barrow, this, this can, on the other side of the hill? Now, I think that is crucially important. So does that mean there might be a burial in it? I hope so, Tony. I mean, the radar looked very much like there was one. And, of course, that's important because, OK, we've got the living, but we've also got the dead. We've got their ancestors. So that adds to the importance of this place. We're really starting to be able to tell the story of this place, aren't we? Oh, this place is beginning to hum, yeah. Except that after last night's torrential rain, it's also turned into a quagmire. It's causing us one or two minor technical problems. Unless we want to excavate in snorkels and flippers, first we're going to have to bail out the trenches. It's 10.45 on day two, and we're opening a third trench here to excavate the mound with a dip underneath it that we picked up on the radar yesterday. If this is a stone-lined grave, it'll give us a pretty accurate date for this part of the site. As I understand it, Raksha, mm -hmm. If these are post holes, we yeah. could be looking at a palisade that's made up of like one large one and then lots of little, almost stake like post holes yeah. in between. Back in Trench One, there's been a breakthrough. We found the first evidence that the earthwork was fortified. This looks 
pretty convincing. This is a huge one here. Mm. You've got one at the top. Yeah. And then we've got lots of kind of smaller tentative ones, don't we? Yeah, I mean, I th this, this could be one here. Um, a bit further down. This could be one here. Uh, and then an interesting one down here, which at the moment, actually, can you see that orange there? Yeah. That could be some burned clay. And there's actually charcoal fleck in it. And, from past studies on, on these things, they're um, often a good indicator for actual post holes. These post holes could have been used for the sharpened wooden stakes of a palisade built on top of the earthwork to defend whatever was up here. And there's now more evidence for that in Trench 3, because what we thought was a grave for the dead actually turns out to be a place for the living. What it looks like we have is that looks to be a foundation trench associated with a roundhouse. Ah, here. yeah. You can see there is this dark stripe across here and then mm. lovely sort of packing stones really yep. rammed in there to make a good foundation. Yep. So the whole the roundhouse sort of goes up slope here and I believe there are another two p potential roundhouses just a bit further up. But the fact is that if you open up this little area and you inadvertently stumble upon a roundhouse, you don't know it's here. Mm. I mean, if we don't know that this one's here, how many more roundhouses were there? The whole hillside could be smothered in roundhouses. We've now confirmed not one, but two roundhouses that Phil believes could be part of a much bigger settlement. So we're now convinced this earthwork was built to protect the people living on the promontory behind it. And we think they may have been rather special, because a fort like this was a clear display of their power and wealth to the outside world. And it was a world that Nokdu was surprisingly close to, because the prehistoric people living here didn't confine themselves to the Antrim coast. They also had links with communities from across the Irish Sea, shown by these intriguing tools from local museums. There's plenty of evidence that uh, this high-quality Antrim flint was actually travelling across the sea to Scotland. How do we know that? Ah, oh, well, there's things like this fantastic hoard uh, that was found in 1990 by a schoolboy, and it's got five ready-to-use flint axe heads. And where were they found? They're found at Campbelltown here, you see, just in across... Scotland? Yeah, absolutely. Where are these ones from? Well, now, that's another part of the story. So it wasn't just stuff going from Ireland to Britain. You get stuff coming back from Britain to Ireland. So these two are from Great Langdale in the Lake District. Uh, again, it's a site where they were knocking out tens of thousands of these things. So mm -hmm. these ones here, yeah. these started out in the Lake District and they were found here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, what, nearly 100 have been found in Ireland now. If trading was going on, mm -hmm. do you think they'd also have been what you might call cultural exchanges, ideas crossing and mm. people crossing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, they were intermarrying, they were related to each other. We know this because they were using the same kind of pottery, they were sharing designs, and also the, the, the tombs that they were building, these big megalithic tombs, they were exactly the same on either side, either side of the channel. It's funny, isn't it, because when you climb to the top of that hill, you imagine that that prehistoric community was really isolated, but you're saying that it's actually got connections with places hundreds of miles away. Absolutely, yeah. Back on site, our hamlet has become a village, but Stuart's got a puzzle. He thinks he's now found a staggering 14 roundhouses, but they're not all the same. You see, they're all separated, they're kind of detached. So this um, might have a different function? Well, I still think it's probably a house, but it, 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 it may even be a different chronological date to that group over there. Yeah. And this one, as well as the big bank round it, it's also got a raised interior, which makes this one very different to all the others. So it'd be worth putting in a trench in here just to see, see what this one is. And provided they don't get lost in the fog, we might find someone to dig it, because this is turning into a battle with the elements. The road leading up here is now a sea of mud, and unfortunately our tractor can't swim. There's only one thing for it, we'll have to excavate it. It's mid-afternoon, day two. It's getting absolutely ridiculous. I left the tent, which I think is over there, about seven minutes ago, looking for Phil's trench. I can't find it. I've passed two groups of people who were also looking for trenches, which they hadn't been able to find either. I've started shouting for him, but the 
problem is he's actually a bit deaf, so everyone else keeps an answering, and I go blundering off in the wrong direction. Uh, oh, I'll find him sometime, I suppose. While we stumble around on the promontory, down in the incident room, Henry's got a major find. He thinks he's found the entrance onto the whole site, cutting through the earthwork at the furthest end. But you can see the actual entrance coming through, you see the outer bank breaking that and coming up into the, into the inner bank. So playing with the, the geophysics on that. So that's magnetic data. Perhaps more impressively, you can just see the break in it with the big blue, blue line. If this was the entrance, then digging here could be key to understanding the site. We have actually started to really get our head round what's going on in here. We do have the back wall coming round there. It is swinging round here. We've got a really well-preserved roundhouse, about nine metres in diameter. What do you think that big post hole might be for? Well, maybe to support something in the roof, but equally, it could be something related to a hearth here. There was the traces of, of, of charcoal in the centre here, which is where you'd expect the hearth to be. And, of course, we do have at the back here what looks like possibly a, a gully. So you can imagine that there's this water cascading down the hill, and this ditch is here to deflect the water around the roundhouse. Well, I don't know about Francis's theory. If I lived here, I'd never leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> With drainage ditches to keep it dry and proper stone foundations for the walls, this house was built to last. Although the very fact that people were living up here at all shows how determined they must have been. And having confirmed this roundhouse, now Francis wants to find the allotment next door. So he's extending trench two here. For me, the problem with all this fog today is that I've got no clear picture of the site. I've just been blundering around, stumbling across archaeologists in trenches who are either very depressed or very excited. But what is this place for? How does it work? Well, for me, the fog's lifted, Tony, because I could never understand why they put all the effort into these huge defences when they were seeming to defend nothing over there. Sure. Well, what now is apparent is that that was a major settlement, somewhere very important and somewhere to be proud of. Now, the way into settlements is always the most important part. So that's why I've taken you here. Look, down there. You think that this is actually the entrance into the whole settlement. I'm convinced of it, Tony, and I'm very excited because at the bottom there, there's paving, and that's potentially prehistoric. Well, maybe, but the burial that was promised yesterday turned out to be a roundhouse. Still, I suppose we'd better give Francis the benefit of the doubt. So at 10.30 on our final day, we're opening a fifth trench here. Back at the earthwork, careful scraping has paid dividends. Ian's discovered that layers of soil were piled up on top of each other, perhaps over centuries, to form one of the banks. What you seem to have is literally a dump of material on top of this, which is an old ground surface. So this isn't a rampart as such. This is where they've been cleaning the ditch out and they've thrown the material outside to make this bank. Right, and then to make the, the, the purpose of a counter-scarp bank is to make even more of an obstacle of the ditch yeah. behind it. Yeah, and make the ditch deeper by raising the banks beside it. Yeah, OK. So, I mean, actually, this is rather good because it does give us evidence that they were strengthening the defences. Or they were maintaining them. Yeah. I mean, it's not just yeah. a one-off event, one day, one week, one month. They're coming back several times, year after year, to build this bank up, clean out the ditch, maintain it. So it's not just a simple one-off event. No. No, that's smashing. We're convinced the earthwork was being strengthened year after year to defend the people living in the village behind it. But who were they? And what were they defending themselves against? Big questions for the last day. Well, we've still got some odd bits of flint here. Back at the roundhouse in Trench 3, we've had another small breakthrough. God, that's enormous. Ease that out. Oh, wow. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Even I would recognise that. Isn't that gorgeous? Is that, and that's, that's actually a touched-up edge around there, yeah. isn't it? That's, that's handmade. So that's going to be a scraper. That is the best piece we've had, and that is a real tool. Yeah. That's great, but we're still desperate for a date, something a solitary scraper can't give us. 
we need results over at the entranceway in Trench 4. This would have been the sort of ceremonial centre of the site. This was the only major entrance into it. And you came from that direction, and then these earthworks focus you around this corner. Everything is designed to focus people around here and into the entranceway. Tracy, that scatter of stones along there, do you reckon that actually is some kind of roadway? I don't think there can be any doubt about it now, Tony. It's really nice. You've got these large stones here. They're running along the edge. They seem to form curb line to the edge of this road. And in areas where it's undulating, they've put these smaller stones in. Basically, they formed a really nice, hard, flat platform for a road surface to come through. Couldn't this just be 17th century or whatever? No. The only thing we've got from the surface of this so far has been flint flakes, work flint. I think we've got to be looking at an early date and could well be Bronze Age. Fantastic. Finally, we're getting close to dating our site, with some time in the Bronze Age, roughly 4,000 years ago, looking most likely. And what an impressive site this entrance must have been, probably with a guardhouse controlling access to the village beyond. Now, the thing is, Tony, you'd have walked on this roadway. We don't know how far it extends. I mean, if you're heading towards the houses over here, you come into the interior, right? Now, if you look up on the left up here, on the skyline, there are some lumps and bumps. Now, I think they could well turn out to be cairns where the ancestors were buried, overlooking the houses and overlooking the gateway. So you come in through this spectacular entrance with that amazing view behind you. You come up here, the first thing that you see is the ancestors, and beyond it, you've got a view out to the sea. You've got it the sea, perhaps the single biggest clue to what happened on this hill, has been staring us in the face all the time. We know that people in Antrim were exchanging stone tools with communities on the other side. We found plenty of worked flints in our roundhouses, probably from the mine at the foot of the hill. So could trade across the sea explain who these people were and why they were here? In the Bronze Age, don't forget that people had already been navigating these waters for thousands of years, mm. and they would have had those skills passed on from father to son. How would they actually physically know where they were going across these waters? This isn't rocket science, it's coastal navigation, and uh, it's so fortunate in this area where Scotland is only 15 miles away from Northern Ireland. Most days you can see one headland from another. Now look what they've done, this one here. That's, that, is, that is abysmal. <laughs> Bang! Bang and the rip. Oh, that'll do. Mm. But at the end of the day, you could live with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there they are. They are in the Bronze Age, mm -hmm. but they are so totally reliant on flint still. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, there's plenty of it around. That's the thing. Basically, the quality of flint working declined as flint was replaced by metal. These specimens from across our site are so shabby we can finally be certain that our roundhouses and the people living in them are Bronze Age. And so is the earthwork, which radiocarbon dating showed was built during the Middle Bronze Age, roughly 4,000 years ago. If you come up this way, you see you actually start rising on the cliff, well, the first thing you're seeing are these cliffs themselves are hugely dramatic. Henry's really on form. He's made a further discovery. He's found the pathway that prehistoric people would have followed to reach our site. As you rise a bit further, you come around on the edge of the cliffs, following this sort of cliff top path, you come to see our site in profile. Now, at that point, the site is dramatic. Mm -hmm. And then as you keep on going round, that's where the entrance to the site is, right on that edge. That route gives you a very sort of dramatic, almost processional route, route to the site. It's five o'clock, and our three-day battle against the elements is over. At times, we've scarcely been able to find our way in all the rain and fog, but considering what we've found, it's been worth it. Because what we do know is that a major Bronze Age community lived up here that until now, no one knew had even existed. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. 
Welcome to Bedford Pearly Woods in Cambridgeshire. It's the kind of place you'd think would be the enemy of archaeologists because you can't see anything because of all these trees. But take a look at this. This stunning aerial picture was taken by firing lasers between the trees. It shows all the lumps and bumps. And you see this thing here? Could that be a building and another one there and there and there and there? So is this some kind of complex? Well, back in the 1800s, an antiquarian noted the remains of some Roman buildings in this wood and apparently some Roman statues nearby. So could this high-tech picture be showing us those remains and a lot more besides? Maybe some kind of extensive Roman settlement? Because in some places, we can actually see Roman walls on the surface. Look, no, this is silly. You can't have archaeology <laughs> just... It's sticking above the ground. Yeah. It's not under the ground. No doubt, this is why the site was first discovered by an antiquarian back in the early 1800s. And it's because the remains are close to the surface that they've also shown up so well on this LiDAR picture. The colours, by the way, represent height, with green marking the low ground and white the highest. And we know that some of these buildings are Roman because a few test pits have been dug. But not enough to work out what was actually going on here. So we're opening these two trenches to try and solve the mystery. I think we've actually got a stone wall coming here. You can see there seems to be a face there. Yeah. I haven't quite got the other side, but I imagine that it pretty much stops at this side just here. Right. Yep. And it follows the bank. Ah, oh. find. Ah. It's just a bit of uh, tile, isn't it? It's just in the rubble. See the line of the wall there. Oh, right, yeah. Well, I'd say it's a floor tile. That, looks, that looks like Roman floor tile, doesn't Roman it? Roman floor yeah. tile, yeah. Yes. Yep. Very Promising. Good. Very good. So Matt's wall is Roman. And I have to say, it does look suspiciously like it belongs to the same range of structures that Phil's digging some 80 metres away. Have a look at this wall. It's so crisp, so well made so well defined it just goes on and on in that direction and maybe in that direction too and all the archaeology is just below the surface who knows what we'll find mind you the way phil's going won't be long before we find out helen who was the antiquarian who came across this site a couple of hundred years ago he was a chap called Edmund Artis. We've got a photo of him, amazingly. And he was a kind of gentleman archaeologist, antiquarian. He was actually interested in most things. He also was an expert on fossils and geology. And in 1828, he made this completely fantastic map of the area. And the bit we're interested in, our wood, is up here. Now, you can see we've got this lovely red horseshoe-shaped Roman building. And he's also put these brown dots on, which he codes as, as ironworks. And I think these must be uh, pits dug to remove iron ore. Did he actually do any digging? Well, I have been trying to find that out, and I can find no concrete evidence that he actually dug a hole. He, it may have been he just came past and saw earthworks or even standing buildings. Mm -hmm. Stuart, how does his map relate to what we can see on the ground? Well, I, I like it, I do, because when I came up here this morning and sort of walked through, I drew in my sketchbook a shape that looks exactly like that. This thing would have been visible when he drew it. It's still visible now. Isn't it a bit bizarre, though, that he's drawn this horseshoe building, bits of which seem to go under the road? Well, I mean, it's possible that when he came here that he could still see remains of, of bumps going under the surfaces of the road, as it were. But um, whether they carried on into this field, we'll never know, because if you look over there, it's been quarried out and now it's been used as landfill. So we'll never know whether these ranges actually extended into that area. Unfortunately, Edmund Artis never published his written reports, so I guess we'll be finishing the job for him over the next three days. And it looks like Geophys may be able to help. They've managed to survey this clearing and have picked up strong signals to the edge of it, but annoyingly they can't go any further because of the trees. It's really frustrating. I mean, we're actually getting some good results and you can see really strong responses. Like, I think they're probably actually metalworking, ironworking mm -hmm. sort of responses, but they're just... I can't get that bigger picture. But noise is good. Well, ironworking suggests some sort of industrial activity, possibly a nearby furnace. It could also help explain all these pits dotted around the site. What we really need actually is a hey? pen. 
You got a problem? Uh, well, not really a problem so much as we've got a load of rubble coming up again, just like Phil's trench. And what I need to know is whether I can get the machine in, take this down further, or whether you want us to do it by hand. Well, I think your problem is the route, isn't it? This is a national nature reserve, and we've agreed that we won't cut any roots more than one centimetre thick. Good news for the trees, bad news for Faye. So we can take out all the, the, the little rubbish, but just leave the one. <laughs> little rubbish. So, all this stuff that's vital for the growth of the tree. Oh, but Faye's going to have to dig it yeah. by hand. Am I digging underneath this big root then? Well, you'll have to. Well, that's, that's, well, that's going to be interesting, isn't it? And you'll have to do it by hand. Meanwhile, Matt's trench has done its job. It's shown that the Roman buildings extend along here and are all part of one settlement. So we're closing it down and packing Matt off to investigate this large earthwork. It appears to be a building that stands alone, which might mean it's important. But again, gardening comes before archaeology. So, as Matt gets his new trench started, I'm wondering if all the walls and tiles we're discovering means our mystery settlement is a Roman villa, exactly as Edmund Artis predicted back in 1828. So this is an original copy of the artist book that I've been looking at photocopies That's of. That's right, yeah, it's an original copy. And Artis certainly knew Roman. This massive villa was dug by him at nearby Castor. The artist talks about Castor as a major villa, mm -hmm. where he looks at Bedford Purlieu's as a second order villa. And that's a bit confusing, really. And I think probably the answer is that Castor is such an enormous site. And by comparison, what he saw of the Roman remains at Bedford Purlieu's was not unimportant, but lesser when compared with the villa at Castor. But in spite of Artis's description of a villa here, there may be a chance he got it wrong. I'm in two minds, actually. It looks as if it could be a standard Roman villa, but the plan is suspicious, and I suspect the linking with ironworking is very intriguing. Right. This is some stuff we found down the road, just in a cutting, oh. and you can see, feel the difference in weight. Look at the colours. Oh, I, mean, I, could, I could spot that as yeah. I end straight away. That's, exactly. Yeah, it's very different to that, isn't well, it? Well, this will occur in bands underneath this yeah. and stuff, so you've got to get this overburden off. <laughs> you've got to get through this, potentially, to, to get like that, have yeah, you? So, exactly, yeah, exactly, right. yeah. With so many pits to check, it looks like Roger will have his work cut out. But what I find most surprising is that we could have so much industry close to what we suspect is a villa. Interestingly, we're getting evidence that people lived and cooked in the buildings Phil's investigating. Cracking. Absolutely yeah, cracking. What's it like on the other side? Get some of that muck off the other side. Oh yeah, that is some part, and it really. I mean, look, you're gonna. Fantastic, isn't it? This mortarium would have been used for grinding food like corn or maize to make bread, and it suggests that we could be close to a kitchen. Look at all this brick and loads of tile. It's fantastic, yeah. mate. This this is hypercoarse heating flue tile. Look. With the, with the marks on it where the plaster sticks on. You've also got lots of roofing material. These are the, these are the, the clay tiles off the roof, one like that, and then a curved one over like that. So, you know, it's all looking much more like a, a sort of high status building than we thought. Is that painted plaster? Yeah, you've actually got stuff with patterns on it, look, and red patches, and there's even more coming out. Where Matt is, yeah. you've got more of it there, haven't you? There's actually a piece there in the top of this rubble layer with a black painted line across the top. You've got the trench of the day without any doubt, haven't it's, you? It's coming up with the goods, isn't it? So it looks like we could have found the first evidence of a fancy villa here in Matt's trench. We could be thinking about we've got industrial activity here. You know, it's either some furnace or some oven or something like that, a kiln or something. Well, that's why we put the trench here. We yeah. wanted to know what was going on on the inside of the building. And you've nailed it. You've got, you've got something that's, that's giving us activity inside the building. What on earth is that then, Anthony? I have no idea. I've been trying to unravel it for the last 10 minutes. Um, but as the end of the day draws near, it looks like it's Phil's trench that's turned up the most intriguing find so far. Has that been worn by a rope round the well, top? Uh, no, I don't it's think so. Is it a very weathered piece of a statue? Is that an arm going? Ah, well, oh, there you go, you see. I mean, it does make, does make you look. wonder whether that is some sort of an arm down there, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's got something else. Like 
Well, what have we got? A nice yeah. piece of what appears to be possibly a bit of carved stone. This? Is, well, yeah, but what you can't see, Tony, is that round here, yeah. it does look like an arm. It really does. I wouldn't mind. If it's Roman and it's carved stone, that would be a big one for us, wouldn't it? Yep. You were the one who was saying, oh, it's very rare to find things like it this. It is very rare. <laughs> but we have our occasional moments. Yeah. Don't you wish at a moment like this we were 19th century antiquarians? We could just tip it up. We'd actually find out what it is. What, rip it out <laughs> without bothering about uh, well, the archaeology? <laughs> can I point out that, thankfully, we are not 19th century archaeologists. We are responsible 21st century archaeologists. We want to do this properly. Have you got no sense of tradition? No, Basically. Phil's telling us to clear off and come back when he's ready to lift this piece of stone and, crucially, when we'll be able to see the other side of what he's uncovered here. Meanwhile, carefully placed in between the ant's nest and the deadly nightshade bushes, Matt's trench is revealing the first glimpse of some sort of posh structure. Can you see the morph yeah, there? Yeah, coming up, yeah. Yeah, look, there's the edge of another oh, one there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that could be a lead into a flue or something. So this would have formed some kind of floor heating or something like that? Yeah, if it's a hypercourse, yeah, there's sort of peli within the room itself. It begins to look ever, ever more structural. So what's it actually doing? Well, what it's doing now is shining x-rays onto the rock, and uh, the different elements in the rock will sort of uh, reflect those x-rays back. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the intensity of them, we can say what's there and how much is there. Right, so that's, that's nearly 50% oh, there. Good solid iron, that's is, is absolutely. It? I mean, that, that's almost pure iron oxide, really. Ah, if you look here, Stuart, look, we've got almost 2% manganese. What, what's significant about manganese? Well, manganese is one of those things which really helps slag form. It helps slag form, it helps it flow. Oh, I see. You see, and iron smelting is not just about uh, making iron. If you mm. can get your slag to flow nicely, it means your furnace keeps working, doesn't get all clogged up. Ah. So this is fantastic ore, not just for its iron content, mm -hmm. which is very high, but also the other bits and pieces in with it, the other elements in with it, manganese. Fantastic ore to smell. Having established that the pits with the spoil heap around them are to do with mining for iron ore, we now want to check one of the other shallower pits, which could have been done for a different purpose. Meanwhile, over at the posh end of the site, Matt's now extended his trench over the bathhouse and is making quick progress. But ideas are changing. There are several things, actually. I mean, um, w one is that this, the orientation is wrong. It doesn't look like a, a, the plan of a villa that I recognise from elsewhere as a standard courtyard villa. Mm. The new theory is that this bathhouse is not part of a Roman villa, but built for a manager or overseer who was looking after the ironworks here. Is it possible that we're looking at some overseer here who's working on behalf of the state? Right. And the state, of course, I think, have a very, very large presence in the building underneath Castor Village. Oh, yes, yes. And it could be some procurator there who is not only superintending Fenland yeah. um, estates, but iron-working estates as well. Yeah, and how far is Castor? Castor's fantastic, because in, it's only a few miles, a few miles away. That way. And this was also excavated by our antiquarian. Artists spent many years excavating at Castor, where he found enormous building complexes uh, underneath the modern village. It's a good idea. Our site, controlled from Castor, could have been one of several iron production centres situated on the outskirts of Dura Breve, the main trading centre in the region. Ermine Street, the M1 of its day, literally ran through the town, and with the River Neen close by, iron could have been dispatched by road or river to almost anywhere in Roman Britain. And if this bathhouse was for an overseer, it looks like he lived in fine style, judging by these chunks of painted plaster that show the colour scheme of the walls of this building 1,600 years ago. It's a stark contrast to Phil's trench, where there's no sign of painted plaster or luxuries like underfloor heating. But we did find what looked like a carved stone here yesterday. And now that our experts have had time to carefully examine it, I'm curious to know what they think it is. It's a stone. A stone? A stone. But not just any random stone. Phil thinks it's been definitely shaped for some purpose or other. Take a look at this one here. Now that was found just outside in the angle of the walls there. Yeah. Look how that ordinary stone has been used as a whetstone 
to sharpen tools. And it just goes to show that every stone you find on a site like this, you have to look at it, think about it to make sure it's not an artifact. Thanks, I think that's a very good lesson to learn from someone who was sure that was a statue last night. <laughs> it looked very good at the time. <laughs> but at least Phil's trench and Faye's trench put in here have given us lots of useful detail about the actual buildings in this range. Basically, we've got a collapsed building. It's colourful, isn't it? It's great, isn't it? You can just see where you are there. You've got these collapsed stone, this stone wall, and beneath it, we've got this tile layer, which is our roof. Yeah. And then here, we've got more of this kind of collapsed roof building material. It's very black, isn't it? It is. I mean, this building's been burnt down. Right. Although there's a lot more to learn about this range, we now have some idea what these buildings look like. This is a reconstruction of the area where Phil was digging, which we now know was a series of rooms based around a courtyard. We think these were workshops or living accommodation for the people who worked here, a workforce probably of slaves, which would explain why we didn't find any coins or items of real value here. The question now is have we discovered the main iron smelting area up here on the slightly higher ground? Time's ticking away and Mick has called me urgently from over here somewhere because he desperately needs Roger, our man with the suitcase. What's the problem, Mick? We've got some material down here that we're not quite sure what it is. We need you to look at it, Roger, and tell us because we think it might be bloomery stuff, in which case, you know, we're in a furnace, but it may not be, maybe just slag. What can you see there? Well, when you feel it, it's very, very dense. Yeah, it is, certainly is, yeah. It's also quite porous. It doesn't look like slag. Ah. I mean, could it be the bloom? It's either that or roasted ore. Let's have a look, see what you've got. Now, this is what I call a real expert. Someone who'll look at a lump of crud like this and tell you what it is. I, I would be thinking more towards roasting half, having looked at right. that. So that means you can really take all that out then, yeah. doesn't it? So we can get That's on. Good. Yeah. That's pretty efficient. You didn't even use your suitcase. I didn't even need the suitcase. <laughs> so, yeah. We'll keep digging to make sure, but it looks like what we've found is remains of where they've been roasting the ore like this to prepare it for smelting, and the actual furnace won't have been far away. It's a great result. We now know this enclosure is a Roman iron smelting area, and we can now identify what looks to be another similar enclosure just here. But with time almost up, how does our posh bathhouse fit into the story? We know we have a building that collapsed when the site fell out of use in the fourth century, but it's proving tricky to interpret. Sorry, could I just, um, there appears to be another stone on top of this one, which makes me think perhaps we might have a, a robbed wall as opposed to floor. So, that's, um, so now that's a wall, not a floor? It, yeah. So um, I'm, sorry. I'm on the wall now. Good, so you're on the wall, <laughs> yeah, and I'm but, inside. But I'm still over the floor of another room. Possibly. So you've actually got a wall running with, that still means that could be a door jam, yeah. and that looks like the corner of where there was a door. Ah. So there's a room there, and there's a room there. But no wall wall has gone, robbed away. A lot more work's needed here, but we can get some idea of the extent of the bathhouse from the size of this earthwork. And if our theory is right about the link with Castor, then it's possible that our bathhouse was laid out like the one shown here in Artis's picture, which means that we're talking about a building that would have looked something like this. It was probably a standalone facility used by the official overseer on what would have been a state-controlled iron working site. Our dig certainly given me a newfound respect for this man, Edmund Artis, who was clearly a very good archaeologist for his time, but died before he could publish his written reports. His map of the archaeology drawn in 1828 has proved to be largely accurate. And it's not just the buildings, but also the pits he recorded that are key to understanding this site. Goodness me, it's a journey to the centre of the earth. <laughs> what we now know is that in Roman times, a lot of the rubbish was being thrown in these pits. So basically, this pit was open at the same time that those buildings were being occupied and, and used. 
And this looks a bit clayey to me. So is that what they're going for, the clay? Yeah, there's no sign of ironstone or any bands of iron in, uh, ironstone in this at all. So it must be clay for some purpose. And the, the little sort of pock marks and things I can see in there, is this sort of root activity? Well, some of it is, but some of it, some of these dark patches, if you carefully clean them back, you can actually see ads marks or picks marks where they've actually levered the clay out from this pit. Fantastic. We now know not all these pits were dug for iron ore. Many, like this one, would have been dug for clay to build and repair the iron smelting furnaces. So at the end of three days, we can now picture this long-lost Roman settlement as it must have looked in its heyday around 200 AD. What's been hidden in these woods is a massive iron working site with the furnaces and ore roasting pits on the slightly higher ground while the mining was going on here, chasing the seam of natural iron ore. The workshops and living quarters were not far away and were very much second class as mentioned by Edmund Artis. But there was at least one fancy Roman building, a bathhouse, situated well away from the industry here on the eastern side of the site. But our story is not quite over because for the next few hours our archaeologists will be measuring, recording, taking photographs and eventually they'll write a proper archaeological report on this site which is really rather nice because we'll be finishing the job that Edmund Artis, for whatever reason, didn't complete himself. And then when we've all finally gone, nature will take over this whole site again, just as it did nearly 2,000 years ago. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. In advance of one of the biggest building projects in Europe, Archaeologists have been given the chance to investigate before some 30,000 new houses completely cover this area. This picture is based on their fantastic discoveries so far, which include Roman watchtowers, forts, and the frontier road, all built alongside the River Rhine. Yeah, that's not a problem over here. That's a, a river bench. We excavated one ship, a Roman ship, a couple of years ago. But now, uh, after that one was excavated, we discovered another one, and it's still there. So we want to know the date of this ship. So yeah. you didn't excavate? We didn't excavate, it's still there. It's over there, just, just a here. couple of meters down there. None of us can quite believe it. Buried just two meters under here is an intact Roman boat. So, so where's the pointy bit, the prow? Well, we found one end of the ship somewhere over here. And, well, we expect it to be running 30 metres in that direction. 30 metres? What I mean, in other words, it goes right through those trees then? Well, uh, deep down under, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's going down very steep in that direction. What makes you think it's still going to be well preserved in the ground? Well, I hope it still is. I mean, it was there two years ago when uh, uh, the same conditions. I mean, it's, it's waterlogged, really. You have the, the groundwater table is, well, this deep, I guess, right. at the moment. We've got to find it first, haven't we? Uh, so let's get now it's here, mate. And look, we've got a digger. Let's use it. <laughs> let's get started. <laughs> Eric and Hera discovered the boat two years ago, but only had time to expose a fraction of it. Essentially, our goal is to find out how old it is. And personally, I can't wait to get my first glimpse of a genuine Roman boat. But we're also going to try to help sort out what was going on at the Zandveld site that was further along the river. Eric and Hera discovered a Roman watchtower in this area, but because of pottery finds in this field, they think there may be a small Roman fort here too. They're hoping Geophys might be able to locate it for them. Roman forts on this frontier were built within half a day's march of each other, and several have been excavated. The dig here at Alphen Fort turned up many well-preserved Roman coins like this one, which tell a story in themselves. But proving the case for a fort at the Zandfeld site is not going to be easy. But our problem, you see, Tony, is that on that side of the ditch over there, there's going to be a lot of dumping of material in the next few yeah, weeks. Yeah, we've got a few weeks said. left, actually. So we want to look there to see what these Roman finds were that were found earlier. Yeah. On this side, both of these fields are scheduled, but we're only allowed one trench. So 
So we've geophysed in this field, and we're going to geophysize in that field, but we don't want to take a decision on where to dig until we've got both lots done. So yeah, do we right. just have to sit twiddling our thumbs until geophysics has been done? No, we can start on that trench the other side. Excellent. So as the first trench gets underway at the Zandfeld site, I'm going to check how Phil's getting on locating our Roman boat. Phil? Yo! Is this stuff what Eric's guys laid down last time? Yeah, this is the polythene that's directly on top of the boat. There she is. I mean, listen to that. That's as solid as rock, isn't it? Eh? Super, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Come on, you're enjoying this, aren't I you? I certainly am. I mean, that could have been in the ground for five years, couldn't it? But you know, it's been there for 2,000 years. Extraordinary. Incredible, isn't it, eh? Yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of it. It's not just a piece of wood. You know it is actually a boat. I mean, yeah. somebody's actually seen it, they know it's a boat. But there's just so much we don't know about it. At this rate, we'll have it in the water again by Friday. <laughs> <laughs> the boat that Eric and Hera have already excavated was found just a short distance away and is of the same type as the one we're digging. It means that we know our boat should look something like this. This is a zamadam type river barge, named after the place where they were first discovered. These flat bottom barges were used by the army and independent traders to move cargoes along the River Rhine. Most, like this one, have been dated to the second century AD. But according to Eric, our boat could be significantly earlier, which would get the archaeologists really excited. And the preservation of the boat looks to be just as good. Phil, that piece of wood must be at least a metre below the bit that you found. I know, but the main thing is what we've now got the bottom of it. And you can see, look, there's the join between two of the planks and it comes through underneath this, this main rib. There's a heck of a lot of it there, isn't I know. There? Could we have the whole of the boat here, yet? No. Uh, one of the ends of the ship is missing. We don't know if it's the fore or the aft but uh, it's above the groundwater table and uh, completely gone and it only left a soil mark. Phil, what's that lump just below this new piece of wood? Well, we've got one here, and one there, and another one there. These are big chunks of volcanic rock and Yap reckons they've fallen into the boat from the riverbank. Surprisingly, there's no natural stone in the Netherlands and it appears that the Romans shipped in basalt rocks from Germany to try and stop the river eroding the road along the frontier. But right now, as we reach the end of the day, I have to admit that my attention's focused completely on our Roman boat. In fact, what you hear, see, is the top of this plank, the oh, upper it. plank. That's that one there? Yeah, that one there. So what we've got is the full height of the boat in the trench. Yes. Normally, when we excavate anything Roman, it comes out of the ground looking pretty ancient and bedraggled. But this is completely different. Look at the angle of this boat. It's like it was moored here yesterday. And the quality of that timber, it could have been cut last spring. It's fantastically well preserved, isn't it? It doesn't look Storm. ancient at all, no, does it? It's no. modern. This boat's on a steep angle and one end some six metres below ground. Too deep even for geophys to detect with radar. This dig is all about exposing a five metre section of the barge that will allow the experts to find out exactly how old it is. And with the basalt rocks now being lifted out of the way, the diggers can set about revealing more of the boat itself. It appears our boat was abandoned here on a bend in the river. And one of the reasons it's preserved so well is that it's been covered by the wet river silts laid down as the Rhine gradually shifted over the centuries. Eric, in fact, believes that the Roman army's biggest challenge here on the frontier was battling the natural forces of the river and that our barge may be part of that story. It's only now that we've got the basalt blocks off that you can see what a dramatic angle yeah. the boat's at. Nobody would position a ship uh, against a revetment with an angle like this. So are you suggesting that they put it in that position for a particular reason, like being well, a pier or a key or something like that? Well, what we know, we have this, uh, we've done a lot of research in the environment and we know the river was threatening uh, the Roman road in the background around 100 AD. This construction was made in 100 AD. We have dated the, uh, the poles of the construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and its shape, suggests that it was um, meant 
to protect the, the road from erosion. Eric thinks that the boat was used as a barrier to stop the river eroding the bank. The Roman engineers seemed to have fought a constant battle with the river as it kept shifting position. But they'd no other choice because they were surrounded by marshland and everything had to be built on this narrow ridge of sandy soil. But to find out the date means doing something fairly brutal to our boat. Shocking, I know, especially as we haven't revealed the full width of the boat yet. But I'm assured it can all be pieced back together again. Apparently, they need to take quite a few samples in order to get a dendro date. And we'll find out more about that later. Mapping the changing course of the river has been crucial in developing an understanding of the frontier. But as you might imagine, the archaeology is a tad complicated in places. This is especially true of the other site we're digging here at Zanveld. Eric and Hera's excavations found the corner posts of a Roman watchtower built beside the river in the first century. But a hundred years later the river had shifted and pottery finds in this area suggested a bigger Roman presence, something like a small fort, may have been built here in the second century. Essentially, the forts and watchtowers here weren't just about guarding the frontier, but were carefully positioned to control movement along the River Rhine. I think the, the important thing is to realise that it's not only a military corridor. All the forts here depend on their supplies to be brought in from outside. Right. And these supplies are coming up from Switzerland and f later on from Britain. This is the corridor that takes the trade to Scandinavia and to France. Oh, right. So this is the motorway of Europe. Every bit of heavy traffic has to go on this river. Right, yeah. Uh, so, so, so what you're saying is that there's somewhere between um, sort of traffic lights or, or maybe like lighthouses, something like that. Yeah. Damien, you don't do suspense, do you? Uh, I, well, no, I mean, oh, wait a minute. That's fantastic. Look at that. Oh, that is a bit... God, that is a bit nice, isn't it? Some size, isn't it? It's the... It, I tell you what, when you see that against the, the other one that we've just looked at, that has got to be, what, twice the size of Something the like that, yeah. I mean, you, you're talking about twice the capacity at least, twice the volume of cargo. Yeah. And if... I mean, what amazes me too is the condition of the timbers. Mm. The timbers are every bit as good condition as what we've seen yeah. today, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And the size of them too. Yeah. What's your first thoughts? Um, well, it's fantastic. I mean, we should be finding these things in England. We're not, so we have to come here to find them. They'd have had them in England? Uh, well, I think it's likely. We've got lots of Roman ports. We've done a lot of work in Roman port excavation, especially in London. We've got seagoing ships. Phil's first question, though, is fairly basic. Do we now know which end we're digging? I think there is 80% chance that we now know what end of the ship it is. So, we can say 80% certain that this end is the stern. Yes, the back end of the ship. Yeah. That is amazing. What's this thing behind you that looks like a sort of, well, I don't know, it's like a fence post or something? Well, we, we, we've been calling it the mast, but we ain't oh, really see no, but we ain't serious about that. Right. <laughs> well, it does look rather round. And ah, straight. yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a good archaeological reason why it's not. Not the mast. No. Well, you right. see, though, we got those big blocks of basalt. Oh yeah, these are the things we were fetching out yeah, yesterday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, Yat was saying he thinks that they actually tumble in from the, from the bank and oh, they've right. actually tumbled down across the, the base of the boat. Right, yeah. Well, now you see, there you've got basalt down there, but this pole... Dump or something. Yeah, it's just something that has just settled in and I suppose yeah. as the water level's gone, it's, it's, it's settled against yeah. the side of the boat. Yeah. Yesterday, Yap hinted that he'd seen things in this boat that make it a unique discovery. And now he plans to show Phil exactly what he meant by that. He's been busy sticking yellow pins into these planks to indicate where they've been fastened, using a mortise and tenon joint like this, a technique that's never been seen before in any of the Roman boats found here. So what you're saying then, that these, these timbers are not merely joined to these, but they're joined, they are joined together. through there. Yes. That explains why you get pa pairs of them yeah, against the joint. But the main goal of the dig was to find out the date of this boat, and now that moment has finally arrived. According to Eric and Hera, this barge should date well before 100 AD if their theories about this frontier are to be proved right. 
To get the most precise date, the sample has to include the sapwood from just under the bark, as this contains the last growth rings in the tree that show exactly when it was cut down. This sample didn't have the sapwood, but it has given us an approximate date which Esther's working on right now. Um, I can't wait to know. <laughs> All right, I'm showing you here. The last ring of the L-shaped piece dates in 52 AD, the last ring. 52 AD? AD. Right. Add uh, 25 uh, rings, you come to 77 AD, plus minus... Uh, plus minus six or something, and then that's your post date. So 77. The, the, so the, we're looking the at something in the early 80s. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought there'd be some reactionary. <laughs> why, why is you that so it. exciting? No, well, I mean, you it's, you it's it. just about, you I mean, I said 85. Yes, you didn't did. I? Yeah. Yes, I had 55, so I'm way out. Right. I said, I said <laughs> 71. <laughs> <laughs> I said 71. Is this exactly That's the time that you mm -hmm. wanted? Yes, I mean, if you, you asked me mm. this morning, I, yeah. I mean, the only thing I could think of, when was the first serious phase of construction on this land infrastructure? Yeah. To my opinion, it began around 85 AD. That's, that's after seven years of research. So, I, well, that, that was my guess. So, as well as all this infrastructure going in, they, they're getting the shipping the sorted out to bring the supplies. The carriers were so. constructed. So, that was yeah. my <laughs> guess. I think they're quite happy with this day, Esther. Yeah. <laughs> it's always good about <laughs> Esther always brings the good news. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great finish to the dig and their project in this area. Oh, now you can see, really see its boat it's shape, isn't it? But given the importance of this barge, I have to ask them, is there any chance the rest of the boat will ever be excavated? If the groundwater level lowers and we notice that, you know, there's degeneration of the wood, I think you call time team. You think so there's the possibility that one day we might get the phone call? You might. Come and dig the whole yeah. boat? I think, yeah, we have, to do, we have to reschedule time team and do it in four days, I think. <laughs> We might just do that for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we could just pull this entire barge out of the ground right now? Well, with the magic of graphics, we can do just that. This way, we can see the full scale of this unique river barge, which measured just under five metres wide and something like 35 metres long. This is the missing link, as Damien calls it, the earliest example of a Rhine river barge. It was constructed most likely for the Roman army, using a mix of local and Mediterranean shipbuilding techniques. Built around 85 AD, this barge seems to have had a working life of 15 years, before it was deliberately sunk around 100 AD to stop the river Rhine eroding the frontier road, a desperate measure by the Roman engineers fighting a constant battle against the forces of nature. And now there's just enough time to share the news with the people who did all the hard work. Ladies and gentlemen, the dendro date for our barge is, give or take five years, 85 AD, which makes it the earliest Roman barge ever discovered on the northern frontier. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.